News reports have uh, attributed the uh, extreme air pollution levels that we've seen over Sumatra and Singapore uh, in June 2013 and the earlier part of 2014 to um, the burning of forests or to the slash and burn forest clearance for agricultural development. Now we have found something different. Um, we knew from the satellite imagery that over 80% of the areas that have actually burned uh, we've mapped that about 160,000 hectares have burned. So 80% of 160,000 hectares were actually non-forest. Um, um, land ranging from shrubs, exposed soils, uh, to plantations, oil palm or acacia plantations. But we went to the field to find out what these non-forest lands were, were actually made of. Sorry, we flew a drone over uh, seven burn sites in the, in, the, in the areas where the burning had been more, the most severe and we were able to conclude that much of the burning happened in uh, what we called forest cemeteries. In other words, um, areas of land that had already been deforested before fire and which were um, where you could see scattered wood debris everywhere, the remnants of, an, you know, of forests, uh, decapitated stumps, branches lying about, downed trunks, but these areas had not yet been converted to agriculture. So um, this is rather different from the slash and burn forest clearance. What burned last year and in 2014 was not so much forest. These were areas that were already deforested but that had not yet been converted to agriculture. And these areas that burned were on peatlands. Now peatlands in their natural states are um, um, extremely uh, fire resistant. Uh, why? Because um, they are wet all year round. I mean, they're, they're, they're essentially a, a bog or, um, you know, um, um, a, a swamp. And they are covered in lush tropical rainforest. And so the lush tropical, the canopy cover above ground keeps the below ground cool and wet all year round because there's always water. Now what happens is that when these systems get uh, become deforested, when you strip the forest of these lands, um, the peat becomes exposed to soil, to, becomes exposed to, uh, to, to air, and peat in itself is a type of soil which is extremely flammable. It's, uh, it's a type of fuel, it's a type of young coal, decayed organic matter. So here what's happening is that we're having these extremely fire resistant ecosystems in their pristine state turned into extremely fire prone uh, systems in virtue of the fact that the peatlands becomes exposed to the air. There is no longer uh, the, the protection from the vegetation cover because the forest has been removed and on top of this these um, lands are drained because they are swamps and for anybody to grow anything on them for agriculture uh, they need to remove the, 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 the water. So now all it takes is you you know, uh, uh, just a few days, if you want, of little to no rain for these uh, uh, lands to, uh, uh, um, uh, to, to, to burn. So what we, what's happening is that um, it's, it's not just that, it's the combination of the fact that many, many people, migrants, are seeking land in those extremely fire-prone uh, uh, systems, uh, which creates this mess. These systems stay, once they've become deforested, they, stay, they can stay idle for a few years. So um, from, the, from the time the forest is being removed to the time this same plot of land is being converted to agriculture, it might take a few years. And that's something that struck us because we thought that it would normally take up to six months to a year between the time it gets the forest becomes removed and the agricultural area becomes established. But what we are seeing is that a lot of these areas stay idle in this fire-prone system 
for a good number of years before they get converted to agriculture. We don't understand why. There are probably constraints associated to this that we don't know of. But what that means is that the same area repeatedly burns over time. It can burn multiple times. It keeps burning, burning and burning. And that's obviously bad news because it means that every time there's burning, there's haze, there's another episode of, of, uh, of pollution. And what it also means is that you no longer need to have these extreme uh, uh, drought years uh, for these fires to start. All you need is to have just a few consecutive days of no rain in a regular or wetter than average year for these fires to start. So that means that these fires are going to keep recurring more and more often and, and, and it's going to be more and more difficult for anybody to predict them. So that thing, that's the novelty of, of, of our research. This research is really telling us that um, the main problem is, is, is really the destruction of peatlands. And um, what, really, what we really advocate is to actually stop the conversion of peatlands and the drainage of peatlands, uh, further conversion of these peatlands. Because what we're seeing is that um, the destruction of these peatlands is a lose-lose situation wherever you look at it. Um, um, it's, um, uh, peatlands um, are not uh, deemed suitable for agriculture. In fact, for, uh, you know, farmers would, like to, would tend to avoid farming on peatlands. They would prefer to farm on mineral soils. But what's happened with the growth of population, you know, there's less and less good land available, then people have started developing techniques with the technology as well to develop those peatlands for agricultural uh, 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 development. And uh, it really started in the, in the early 1990s. So this is pretty recent. We're talking like 20 years or 25 years ago when it really started. And, but uh, the development of peatlands is really, really costly. You need to drain them, so you need to, have, you need to use uh, um, uh, excavators, heavy machineries. And uh, in themselves, peatlands are also really not really, they're not very suitable for agriculture. They're very acidic soil, so you can't grow anything you like. You have to often bring topsoil if you want to grow uh, uh, crops that are not really suitable for these systems. So they're very costly, very expensive. Secondly, um, they create um, a lot of pollution, you know, um, every time you burn there's a haze event, um, they emit a lot of greenhouse gases and, they, um, and uh, they emit a lot of aerosols which are particularly noxious for people, you know, for this particulate matter, this pollution, this haze that people will inhale either in cities or in the neighbourhood or in the vicinity of the fires. So really, uh, what we advocate is the, 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 uh, the, the, to, to stop the development of uh, the further development and drainage of, of peatlands. Peatlands are, um, when they burn, they um, release far more uh, greenhouse gases and aerosols per unit area of burning than any other land use. Um, and we have to re we have to realize that these fires are not your typical fire that you'll find in southern Europe or in California or in Australia where we're having these wild flaming fires you know these gigantic flames destroying homes and you really have to run away for your life because otherwise the, the fire will kill you now in this case we're not talking about flaming fires we're talking about smoldering fires and smoldering fire fires um, are almost flameless and they generate far more smoke and far more you know, greenhouse gases, CO2, methane and, um, and CO than the flaming fires. And so we need to understand what is the level of toxicity generated by these fires, both from the point of view of greenhouse emissions but also from the point of view of your health, so understanding how much aerosols, particulate matter, these systems are emitting. It will also, if we know better, if we can quantify better what's being emitted by those smoldering fires, then we will also, uh, it will help uh, the Indonesian government to better establish a baseline against which it could then start to, you know, 
um, um, uh, uh, sell carbon credits. Uh, the uh, Singaporean government um, uh, ratified um, a, a, a law which essentially enables, gives the legal right to uh, uh, prosecute anybody who's found guilty to uh, uh, create haze over Singapore. Which, but which would mean that any executive of a company involved in burning somewhere in Sumatra, stepping foot on Singaporean soil, could be arrested or questioned, detained and eventually be fined for, for, for wrongdoing if found guilty. I think this is a, a, a step in the, in the right direction because it really sends a strong signal to those who are creating this mess that uh, uh, they will uh, face consequences if, uh, if, um, if they uh, go to uh, Singapore. However, um, we um, the, the, the Singaporean government doesn't fully realise that the situation on the ground is a lot more complex than what they think. Um, this law is primarily going to target the large companies, uh, the conglomerates, the oil palm and acacia companies who operate in Sumatra and the executive who work for these companies. Now, um, our research tends to suggest that um, if companies are involved in burning, uh, they are not the only ones. And in some cases, um, the companies, I'm um, thinking of the acacia companies in particular, um, might actually be the victim of the fires more than the culprits. And so this law uh, will, uh, does not yet, I think, have the tools to uh, uh, um, um, tackle this complexity on the ground. I mean, for example, um, um, the Singaporean government is thinking of prosecuting uh, uh, companies um, based on the evidence that uh, there's fire being found inside the concessions of the companies. But our research tends to show that if there's burning inside the company, it might not necessarily be the company who's starting the fire. And there's two main reasons for that. One is because, well, the fire might actually start outside and, you know, spread uncontrolled in the back, within the concession because of wind, for example. And secondly, um, um, the concession might be occupied, parts of the concessions might be occupied by land users who are unrelated to the concessions. Uh, community, uh, um, um, communities, whether local people or migrants or maybe small-scale companies um, who operate um, illegally in the sense within the concessions but who have backup from maybe the local elite, you know, um, um, maybe uh, from a village head for example and who have also financial backup from mid-level investors who might be living in cities like in Medan or in Jakarta, who are investing in oil palm. So this complexity really must be understood through research by going in the field, doing ethnographic studies. I think we've gone as far as we could using the remote sensing tools that we have, you know, the, the drone, the satellites and so on. But now it's time to go in the field and really understand what's going on. And because by understanding what's going on, you understand who is burning, who's responsible, who's gaining and who's losing from these fires.